Well, as people are still coming in, I want to welcome you uh, on this chilly Wednesday evening. Uh, this will be a warm service. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. The Lenten um, celebration of Ash Wednesday uh, is not specifically from biblical times. It, it, it began, I think, in the 11th century. But the symbolism is all biblical. Um, Lenten, the Lenten season, of course, is a season of repentance uh, and rededication to the Lord, noting his sacrifice. That's why many of us give up something for Lent, just to remind us of his sacrifice. Um, the imposition of ashes, of course, is all throughout the Old Testament. We repent with dust and ashes. Um, we are, we are um, um, to dust, uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And, and all of that biblical language tells us that we are beholden to a creator that made us mortal. And therefore, we should discipline these bodies in ways that will remind us of him. And that's what this somber season is about. And so we want to welcome all of you, especially those of you online. I know there are many of you online. Somebody signed in as the Fantastic Four. I, don't, I can just picture you. I don't know who you are, but I just picture you. Willard's from Canada, uh, people from Trinidad, Trad, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and, and, and hundreds of others. Uh, and we welcome you to this service. Um, you will be instructed as we go along what to do next. Uh, but let me tell you one thing that we're doing as a church um, during the Lenten season. I don't know about you, but for me to really get into dedicating, rededicating myself, um, I can't, I, I've got to have a program. I've got, to have a, I've got to have something that I do, a pattern, a new pattern for my life. Uh, and so the Lenten studies we've done has, have always been a great um, assistance to me in my spiritual life um, and in my rede personal rededication to the Lord. This year will be no exception. Um, we are doing a study called The Crucified Life. And we want to invite all of you to do this study. You can do this alone. You can do this by yourself just as a pattern. Um, uh, I, we would love it if you would gather some folks around you um, um, and, and, and go through it with them. Uh, because it's designed for discussion, and that would be very helpful. But whether you do it alone or you do it with someone, we have, we will, uh, if you're in the, uh, at the Longwood site, we have um, books available after the service if you want to pick them up. Um, and just let's go through it as a church. Because again, even though the Lenten season is the most personal um, uh, response to the Lord, it's a personal um, sacrifice and rededication to the Lord. Yet, when we do it in community and we know that others are doing it, it makes it even more personal. Uh, and so we would, uh, we would invite you to do that with us. Well, we're going to hear my favorite preacher tonight, my best buddy, Pastor Vernon, is going to bring us the message, and I can't wait. And so, therefore, I'm not going to. Let's have a moment where we stand up and greet one another and tell one another, we're glad you're here tonight. Would you remain standing and let's worship together.
Brothers and sisters, would you join me in this litany of penitence? Let's say it together. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. We confess to you, Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, Lord, our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, Lord, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, Lord, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. We confess to you, Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone, from the first to the last, has won my affection and bound my soul fast. Sweet mercy, I could not live here. Sin would reduce me to utter despair. But through thy free goodness, my spirit's revived. And he that first made me still keeps me alive. Thy mercy. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us. Accept our repentance, Lord. 
for our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world by the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord. Bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Amen. You may be seated. Would you hear now these words of assurance of pardon that we have from 1 John chapter 4. We have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Jesus we remember tonight is the Savior of the world. In Christ, we are forgiven, and through him, God abides with even us. Amen. Runs like a hurricane I am a tree Bending I am unaware of These afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize Just how beautiful You are and how great Your affections are For me And oh
Would you stand and pray with me? So Lord Jesus, we come to you on this Ash Wednesday to be reminded of the great journey that you would make to the cross. A journey that began before time, a journey that was assured of in the garden, a journey that would be foretold by the prophets and a journey that was lived out in front of the people's eyes right around you. But it's a journey that has continued to compel your people to follow closely, to pay close attention, to take note of the way you loved so that in turn we can love that way. So focus us on who you are, what you've done. Help us to take that into account as we consider what it means to live a crucified life throughout this season of Lent and through all eternity. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so, I don't know if you caught the news yesterday of the young man in Jupiter, Florida, who was arrested because he threw a live alligator through the drive through window at a Wendy's. And you, did you hear about this? When I saw this in, on the little ticker that I have on my phone, I, I had to go see the whole story. It was just sounded too good to miss. And sure enough, uh, investigators, it says in the paper, identified Joshua James of Jupiter, Florida as the man who tossed a three and a half foot reptile into a Wendy's last fall, according to a Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission incident report. They just discovered it though yesterday, who he actually was from surveillance uh, cameras at a gas station next door to the Wendy's. And so it says in the paper, he faces three charges related to the incident. Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, <laughs> unlawful sale, possession, or transporting of an alligator, and petty theft. Once approached by authorities, James admitted to having picked up the alligator along the side of a road, driving to Wendy's and throwing the gator through the drive through window. And here's maybe the best part of the story. A judge on Tuesday ordered James to, one, stay away from all Wendy's restaurants, two, to avoid possessing any weapons, three, to get a mental health evaluation, and then four, to limit his contact with animals, all animals, except for his mother's dog. I would love to see what his mother's dog looks like. But then here really is the best part of the story. So you can actually go on YouTube and see this clip. I know I'm way more into this than any of you are. But something about behavior like this just intrigues me. And so I went and watched the clip and they had, a, had his mom and dad in an interview sitting on a sofa talking about their son and here's what his mother said. His mother said, he's a prankster. He's always been a prankster. He's not a bad guy, he's just stupid. <laughs> Thank you, mom, for that decree. So maybe he was stupid. Maybe he was just a prankster, or maybe he was just being benevolent. Maybe he just loves alligators. And maybe he just figured the best place, the place any alligator would want to live is somewhere where there's always fresh meat and a full salad bar. I mean, all the time. And, and so maybe he had good motives. But I'm guessing that by today, Mr. James is sitting somewhere in South Florida thinking, what was I thinking? Have you ever had that feeling? I've had that feeling many times. What was I thinking? What in the world was I thinking? I know the feeling, and I know that question deep in my own life. And I tell you that because there is no good way to frame behavior like that. Somewhere along the way, his behavior needed to be changed uh, 
to where he thought about alligators in a different way than he did, or something needed to happen. Lent is a season for us to not just ask the question, what was I thinking? But it's a season to ask the question, what will I be thinking? What will I think? Lent is a season to create space in our lives. For many of us, it will mean removing something central so we can focus on something supreme. For some, it is adding something simple so that you can focus on the profound. As James K.A. Smith, a great theologian that Pete first told me about, wrote, my participation in the formative disciplines of Lent isn't another chance for me to show something to God or others. Rather, it is an invitation to have my hungers retrained, to have my hungers retrained. It's Ash Wednesday. And as another friend of mine, J.D. Walt, has written just today, it is a rehearsal of the saddest day in the history of history. It is a solemn remembrance of the fateful choice of our ancient ancestors to break faith with God into a world of unending blessing. We chose an unfathomable curse, a curse that would be reflected in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, with the words Pastor Joel reminded us at, at the beginning, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. It's a reminder that death was never part of the plan, but it became so interwoven into the plan that someone significant, the most significant one, would have to die. And so it remains God's plan. And what I want to impress upon you in these few minutes that I speak is that it is a journey. These 40 days into Easter will be a journey for us. And the success of that journey will depend upon how seriously you consider the journey. How seriously you hear those words from Genesis chapter 3. To really comprehend what this means, though, you have to pan back from Genesis 3 to the original creation poem to understand how we got to the place we are tonight on Ash Wednesday. In Genesis chapter 1, you know this story well. The simple answer that God had for everything was that he would create. You've heard Pastor Joel teach this over and over again, that God's pattern in creation was that he would create an environment and then he would fill it. He would create an environment and then he would fill it. And God said something each time that he did that. Do you remember what it was? He would say it was what? He would say it was good. That word in Hebrew culminates in, in Genesis 1.31, after he had created humanity, God said these words, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That word is a Hebrew word. The word is tov, T-O-V in our, in our transliteration of it. And what it means is something that is difficult for us to explain in English. But it means it's just like I pictured it. It's just like I wanted it to be. Have you ever accomplished something, created something, and when you get finished with it, you say, it's so wonderful. It's just exactly like I pictured it. Well, this pattern that God started with this word, it means that the created is working exactly like the creator meant for it to work, even longed for. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who used to be here in this church who is, who is a Hebrew scholar, and she was telling me that when you get to that place where, it, where in Genesis 131 when it says very good, that it's hard for us to fully grasp what the very means in its good. It's like it's so good 
that it was when God created humanity that it was better than even God had imagined. And I pushed back on her and I said, how can that be? God is never caught by surprise. And she said, no, it's just, it's the feeling of that word. That it was just better than God ever even imagined it was be. He pictured it this way. And then it was better. It was good. It was tov. And so the beauty of this creation story though took on another meaning when sin entered into it. It didn't cease to be good, but it did change because that word tov continues throughout the Old Testament. It did change though. And here's how it changed. It changed because of the patterns that life and death must produce. Now, God created the seasons, and as he did, he indicated that they were tov, they were good, meaning that all of creation yields to the change in the universe, that things come and go, they are, they are planted, they are produced, they are harvested, they go back into the ground. That is a cycle, a pattern that God built into creation. And it is a part of the design. We live in an ever-expanded universe. And we were designed to be ever-changing. To be ever-changing. Now, some change is easier. Change is easier for some people more than other people. Some people just don't want anything to change. Some of us want everything always just to remain the same. Some of you are old enough to remember Billy Joel's song, Don't Go Changing, to try to please me. I love you just the way you are. Those of us who have been in long-term relationships know that that was a great song, but it's really not true that we're going to change. We must change. You know, the, the guy that Connie married at 19 years old is not the guy she's married to today. And it's still me. But I've changed a lot since then. Because that's part of the design. It's part of the plan. So maybe a goal that, that we could think about during this Lenten season is some areas that maybe we would want to change. Not just improve, but really change. Because change works both ways in our life, doesn't it? That there are things in, our, in us that can change for the better and there are things that can change for the worse. And during this season might be a time where we could look at some things we could change, not just improve. Things like that my prayer life would be stronger, that my faith would be stronger, that my generosity could be increased. Maybe I could be kinder. Maybe I could be more patient. Maybe I could learn some skill to, that would be useful to my community or even to the world. But here's what usually stops us from changing, from growing. What usually stops us from changing is not just good. It's trying to be perfect. It's, it's when we think that the goal is to be perfect that we get stopped dead in our tracks. It's sort of like if you want to play the piano and then you discovered that there are 88 keys plus on that piano and you only have 10 fingers. And when you start doing the math, you realize there's a whole lot of movement required to cover 88 keys. Or maybe you hear somebody like Pete play and it just, you just realize, I'll never play that well. And so I just don't try. I just realize how hard it is and I just don't try. I could give you a hundred examples of that. But you know them in your own life. The things that you've picked up for just a little while. The ones, the, those of us who joined the gym on January 1st. How's that going? <laughs> you didn't get the body immediately that you thought you'd get. So you just, you just don't try anymore. Perfect is the enemy of good. Can I tell you a giant secret? You weren't made to be perfect. You were made to be good, to be tov. But wait, you're thinking, doesn't Jesus say, be perfect 
as your Father in heaven is perfect? As a matter of fact, he does say that. And you probably know where it is if you thought of that right off. Matthew 5, 48. You, are there, you therefore must be perfect, Jesus said, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And it tripped me up for a little bit to think about that. But you know, when you go in and look at what that word perfect is, it's actually a, not a great translation of, of, of what Jesus was saying. The word is teleos, and the definition of that is complete in all its part. It, it's, it's a sense of wholeness, of being whole, perfect in the whole sense of the word. But you also have to look at that verse in context. It's not a behavioral verse. It's actually a verse about love. Jesus has started that, that, that talk and you can look it up later and see what I mean by this. That he starts telling them about how we are to love, not just those who love us, because he says anyone can do that, you know, to love the people that love you. But you should love your enemies. Try that. Love those who have not earned your love. Try that. Because he, Jesus says that's the bar that the Heavenly Father has set. That's the standard. That's the kind of perfect. Be perfect in your love. It's not a behavioral statement at all. And so we hear that and we, we get snakes in our head and, and start thinking that somehow we have to have this perfection. Uh, Eugene Peterson puts it another way. Let me read his paraphrase of Matthew 5, 48. He says this, in a word, what I'm saying is, grow up, your kingdom subjects. Now live like it, live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. It's goodness that Jesus is calling us to here. It's tov. Here's a way to understand this even better, I think. Only God is perfect. Because when you have reached perfection, where is there to go from there? There's nowhere to go. That means you're unchanging at that point. Is God unchanging? He is. The Bible tells us. He never, God never changes because he, has, he is perfect and he is complete in all that he is, in all that he does, in all that he wants to do. God is perfect and complete and never changes. But you and I, we're not perfect. We do need to change. And so therefore what perfection looks like in the community of the church is legalism. We mistake it all the time. And, and so as long as we're good, we're changing. And all, as long as we're changing, we're moving toward the standard that God has for us. In fact, I have an example. I meant to bring these out here with me. Like to understand things that change and don't change. If the, if the definition of something not changing is perfect, then may, I was trying to think, what is a better example than delicious Hostess Twinkies, right? Because you know what? I could give you a Hostess Twinkie tonight, and you could either enjoy it tonight after the service, you know, or you could take it home and, and put it in your pantry and enjoy it a year from now. Or you could put it deep into your pantry and enjoy it 30 years from now and you will never lose the delicious taste of this golden cake filled with a creamy center. You will never lose this joy because this will never change. You know, they have yet to determine the shelf life of a Hostess Twinkie. And so let me ask you a question. Is this perfect? Is this perfect? <laughs> Students back there saying it is perfect. I'd like to have one and they're for you, I promise. If you wanna come get it? Come get it. <laughs> come get it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> until they run out 
until they run out. Here, take the box back there with you. I don't, <laughs> get it from him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the deal is, Hostess Twinkies, they are good. I had one before the service. They are good. And they are perfect. But they don't change. And so are they good for you? <laughs> Your mother told you to say that, did but let me give you another example. I actually was just walking through Publix today and saw these and thought about it. Um, how about this? Yeah. Grown right here in Southern California. Um, so this orange, while it has some characteristics that look like a Twinkie, I mean, it's sort of similar in color. But let me ask you a question. Is this perfect? Yes. <laughs> Actually, it's not perfect. Because let me tell you, this orange is dying. You know, as soon as this orange was pulled from the tree, it began to die. Now, it's dying for a purpose. It's dying for a purpose, and the purpose is it will continue to change. If you were to carry this orange home and put it in your pantry, you couldn't eat it a year from now. It won't even be there a year from now. It'll be carried off, if you do things like that, it'll be carried off by the rats that live in your pantry. <laughs> but it'll eventually, it'll soon go back into the earth from whence it came in one way or another. But I would tell you, if you, if I had any left, I'd hold it up here, but if, if you compare an orange and a Twinkie, one changes, one doesn't. Do you want the orange, young man? It's yours. I don't want to throw it, it's a little heavy. All right. So the, the deal here is, think about that for a moment. Think about the significance of what that means for us. So what about us? Do we want to change or do we want to stay the same? Because if you, if you don't change, you might as well be a Twinkie. I mean, <laughs> because that's about the value that we have on this earth. I read this great thing, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book called The Hole in Our Holiness and, and in it um, DeYoung writes these words, he says that sanctification is not by surrender but by divinely enabled toil and effort. He also makes the point that you can't wait for your life to change. You, when you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that is of no effort of yours. Jesus does all the work. But for us to move toward holiness, we're significantly committed to that process. We're significantly involved by the choices and the decisions we make to change every day. And DeYoung says that it not only impacts us as individuals, but it impacts our communities as well. Just as original sin impacted all of creation, and the result is that all of creation now is groaning for fulfillment to be restored. But the way this manifests itself in our communities, James, the apostle James addressed in James chapter four, when he writes these words to the church there that is bickering and complaining and yelling at one another, and James says, sounds sort of like, well, it, they're bickering and yelling at one another, and James says, well, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, and so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
And so what James is saying then and is saying now to us is this comes back to what are our motives? What are our motives for wanting to change? Is it for the betterment? Is it for the good of one another? What are our motives in wanting to do this? And so what changes need to take place in our lives? I've been captured by this thought that if I could disciple my desires, that it would take me a long way down the road toward truly being like Jesus. If I could take the desires I have, realizing there, some are good, some are bad, but all of them God is aware of, and if, and if I can disciple them, if I can focus them around who Jesus is and what he did, then would that not ultimately produce the things in me that would make me look and sound a lot more like Jesus? I think it would. As Pastor Joel continues to remind us, discipleship is not behavior modification. It's not about getting your behavior in line. It's about getting your life in a direction toward Jesus. It's, it's tov. It's good. It's being what you were designed to be. It, it's being changed in a way that you can be just like God pictured you to be. He has a picture of you. He has your picture. You know, years ago, one of my... One of my uh, friends in youth ministry used the illustration, and I've borrowed enough times at this point, it's kind of my illustration, that, that I used to tell students all the time, you know, God's got your picture in his wallet, carries you around. He, he knows you. He has a picture of who you are. And his great desire, I think, for all of us is to be who he designed us to be, to be tov. So how will you do this? What if you were to make a list of your desires, of your real desires, and then ask the hard questions about whether they are moving you into a position of purpose, of change, of yielding to the power and provision of the Creator? Ask the hard questions of what are you dependent on that is not Jesus? What occupies the central spaces of your heart? For some of us, it is us. But it could be anything. And in doing that, we do the hard work that is part of creation continuing to move toward tov, toward goodness that God designed us to live in the midst of. Doing that hard work moves us in that direction. Audrey Assad has written a hauntingly beautiful song. It's really a meditation. It's a lit lit liturgical song. And it has these lyrics in it. From the love of my own comfort, from the fear of having nothing, from a life of worldly passions, deliver me, O oh God from the need to be understood, and from a need to be accepted, from the fear of being lonely. Deliver me, O oh God. I don't know if you have a mantra for those times in the night when you wake up and the world isn't working the way you pictured it, the way you thought it should, and the way you want it to. I have one. It's these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me through the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest 
a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness will follow me. Do you know what the word is in that verse for goodness? Do you know what the word is? By now you do. It's tov. Surely tov will follow me all the days of my life. And then remember this. God's expectation of you is not to be perfect. It's to be good, to be whole, to be yielded. It is to be tov.
So I'm going to ask those who are, uh, we literally call them the imposers, those who are going to impose the ashes on you tonight to move to the locations from where they will do that. And if this is a new experience for you. Let me give you just a, a word or two of, of encouragement about it and the reason we, and to remind you of why we do it. As Pastor Joel said, this is a tradition that the church has used since the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And it's a, it's a symbolic reminder of the role that death plays in the redemption story. Before there can be resurrection, there had to be death. So it's even why our Lenten study is called the crucified life. And so what we're, the way we will end this service tonight is simply this. Um, let me first of all say a word to our friends online. We realize you may not be able to uh, do this unless you have a, a fireplace and you can get some uh, ash from that and rub it on your forehead. You can impose upon yourself if you want to. But for those of us here, what we'll do is, this is just as you're ready to go, then you just move to where one of these folks are. Some of them are behind you. Some of them will be at the back doors. And this is just as you're ready to go, you just get up and they will make the sign of the cross on your forehead. They'll say some words to you that are ancient words and that the church has used for, for millennia, actually. And then as you go out from this room, Ash Wednesday is, is a place of beginning. It's a place of starting our journey. This is not, okay, rah, rah, we're fired up, you know, 40 days doing something big. This is, this is 40 days of taking into consideration how we can disciple our desires. And tonight before you go to bed, you'll probably wash that cross off. And there's even some symbolism in that to realize that you've been washed in the blood of the lamb. You've been made clean. So this journey is not a journey to perfection. It's a journey to step by step, take the next good step that you can in your life. So as you're ready to go, Feel free just to get up and move to the imposers and then make your way out. And as you do that, brothers and sisters, I tell you to go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.